All right, we were reminiscing about two years ago in in that very spot inside that window in there. Jack Swarbrick standing there and saying, we're about to have a two sun solar system with the SEC and the Big Ten and their gravitational pulls. And everybody's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> you know what he was talking about? I think so. And I imagine the AD at Notre Dame at the time would know these things, but like how, how strange is it to think that, you know, we've been coming to this thing for years, but now we sit here, Florida state is suing the ACC. The ACC is suing Florida state. Clemson is suing the ACC. The ACC is suing Clemson. SMU is here. Cal is here. Stanford is here. It's, it's wild. Yeah, it's wild. I mean, you think about just from where we were a year ago, because these meetings have been kind of, I think, as you said, you know, things have been trending probably not in a great direction for the ACC for several years. And you kind of wondered, okay, would the ACC network save them? Would, would you know, what, what could save or realignment, what could save the ACC? And a year ago, we're here and um, never could have imagined what would happen in the next 12 months. Because right. now you're sitting here and they're all suing each other. Well, and I was thinking about this as I was coming here. You know, I think if you'd asked me a year ago, would there be no Pac-12 in a year? I still thought, even at this point, even in May of last year, they'll figure it out. Like, they always figure it out. And then, no. And now, you know, Oregon and Washington end up moving to the Big Ten. You've got Cal and Stanford here in the ACC. And, you know, the, the school you cover, Florida State, is in a, this – like think about what's happened at Florida state in a year. You've had all the drama with the ACC. You've had a 13 and 0 ACC championship season where they are left out of a 14 playoff, which sort of underscored everything they've been saying all along. And so how do like, if you are Michael Alford, the, the AD at Florida state, how do you approach this meeting with all these guys? And I realize he's been meeting with people from the ACC for all this time, but like, how do you handle the big picture stuff? Yeah, I think that's the challenge with, um, in a lot of ways, because you have, you do have the the normal operating business that has to take place, and like, mm -hmm. you know, just uh, I was thinking about, um, just you know, things like personal re interactions. You know, when when Mike Martin Senior, Florida State's legendary mm -hmm. baseball coach, um, passed away a few months ago, you know, Jim Phillips, the commissioner, comes to the funeral, and yeah, he's got a you know he and Michael Offord are, are giving each other hugs, and you know you've got former presidents and current presidents of the university there, and so these are people that have to work together, but then are, they're also having this this really kind of epic battle behind the scenes, and I I guess what it comes down to is I I don't know that I believe the core system is going to ultimately settle all of this. I, right. I do think at some point they're going to have to kind of find some sort of middle ground. I don't think they want the court right. system. I, I think ultimately if, if that, if it comes to that, somebody is yeah. having a very bad yes. next few years it's going poorly so, for somebody. Yeah. yeah. And the process would yeah take a long time. Um, but so, but that process is playing out Yeah, and it almost has to be seen as, is kind of a compartmentalized where when they're at these meetings, they have to conduct the normal business that they're conducting and kind of put that on the background. But it also looms over everything because everybody knows Florida State and Clemson are the two biggest football powers in this conference, and they both are actively trying to leave. Right. And they've got to play a football season right. in this conference that's coming up, that they are going to be in this conference. We, we have a schedule. Yeah. Like, it's not one of those things that can yeah. change at this point. And you know, that that's the the part that's amazing to me is, is they've gotten this far and now, you know, it looks like the cases are going to continue for Florida State in North Carolina, the one the ACC filed, and in Florida, the one Florida State filed, which I, you know, we didn't know when they were both filed. We thought maybe that, that somebody would rule that, hey, we're, we're going to you're going to do this in this other state or. Right. But no, the, the Florida court has said, no, that we think that the ACC was venue shopping. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have this trial here. And the North Carolina court said, no, 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 we're going to have this trial here. And you have all these decisions along the way where you can see why both sides would kind of want it in their state. Because, yeah, yeah, it's uh, a home field advantage. Yeah, and then yeah. you have the North Carolina lawsuit or the ACC's lawsuit in North Carolina. Uh, the judge there is not real, is not really pushing hard for them to reveal the ESPN contract. Right. Some of these preliminary rulings. Whereas the judge in South Carolina, where Clemson's suing the ACC, is like, yeah, you need to produce the ESPN contract. 
in Florida's uh, the judge in the Florida, Florida State's case in Tallahassee is probably heading in the same direction. So you see where venue does play a part. Well, and it's it gets very juicy if that ESPN contract gets revealed because there are details in it. Like Florida State drops this little grenade in its original lawsuit that says, you know, there's a period in, in 2025, in February 2025, where ESPN has to opt in or opt out of the remainder of the ACC deal. Like that's a monumental thing that we still, other than them right. putting it, we haven't actually seen where that is in the contract. Yeah, that's funny because, yeah. like you said, there everybody still has to report it as as FSU is alleging because again they're citing the contract that nobody else has seen. I assume they're telling the truth because uh, why would you lie about and, that? And, and, yeah. where would, and where would you come up with the specifics? Because yeah. they said specifically yeah. <laughs> that the deadline was actually earlier, but then the ACC extended it. Yeah. Because uh, as you said, we we all thought the ESPN contract went till 2036 when the grant of rights extends to, and apparently it doesn't, or at least that's what FSU is alleging, and we'll have to see. Yeah, and we don't know what's going to happen here. We talked about this uh, quite a bit off air. You know, it, it, the timeline of this is very difficult to predict just because you're dealing with three lawsuits well four lawsuits total right. in three different states and you don't know where it's going to go and then you don't know what the big 10 will do what the sec will do what anybody will do if say the acc were to come with a number and say would you like to get out okay write us a check for this yeah and, and you know these meetings used to be we used to come to these meetings to find out where the championship games are going to yes. be held <laughs> yeah. or uh yeah. what, are the, what are the overtime rules going to yeah. be or things like that yeah. now it's uh, obviously a totally different discussion but yeah it, that is the timeline is is impossible to know um i still feel like it's going to be sooner than later just because nobody's going to want this to drag on and 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 like you said it's almost a game of chicken mm -hmm. nobody's going to want to lose this battle so at some point you feel like they'd have to come up with well and the, the reason i keep saying i think the acc will eventually find a number that works it, it's just i'm just deducing logically like if Florida State and Clemson lose their lawsuits, they have to stay in the ACC till at the latest 2036. Right. That's not what they want, but it's probably also not the end of the world. Right, right. If the ACC were to lose in any of these cases, it all right. disintegrates immediately. So like they're they have much more to lose than Florida State and Clemson do in this situation. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And they also, I think, you know, ESPN probably has more chips to play. Yes. And, they, you know, the ESPN's kind of a partner with the ACC and all this, even though they're not named in the lawsuits. Right. Um, but in terms of, you know, they, the ESPN can kind of move chips around. They can mm -hmm. kind of have a say in how it, and ultimately how it's going to affect their bottom line. And they can offer inducements to these schools. Cause, like you said, you know, these other schools in the conference, they don't want to be left high and dry. So it comes down to, okay, what can the ACC and ESPN come up with to make right. it worth their while to say, okay, we'll let Florida state and Clemson leave for X amount of dollars. Yeah. Uh, and that, that part is going to be uh, probably where it all comes down to. Yeah. And, and you said sooner rather than later. And, and I can't, I keep thinking it, it's, it's crazy because all of this stuff is interconnected, whether we, we notice it or not, but like this house versus the NCAA case that we keep talking about on the show and I keep saying, I know it's a kind of a boring topic, but I promise you it, it affects everything. Like when they come up with a settlement for that, that sort of defines who's at the top group of college football. And you got to make sure the ACC wants to be in that, that, which I think they do. I think the ACC and the Big 12 both are going to opt into that. But then. But will every single school. Right. You know. it's, it, it, we don't know. We have no idea because we don't even know what the number is, right. the, the dollar figure is. So. That's the craziest thing. I, I like. I, I keep saying. I think if if Florida State and Clemson were to get out, you're probably talking about 2026, mm -hmm. playing somewhere else, wherever that is, and that's not far away. Yeah. Yeah, and I think there. I think there are people at Florida State that would love it to happen in 2025. Because again, I think it's just they look at these numbers. And again, you know, you as you said, we've been coming to this meeting for a long time. And 10 years ago or 12 years ago when John Swafford was kind of mm -hmm. talking about the revenue gap back then, yeah. you know, it was maybe four or five, $6 million, $7 million yeah. dollars a year. Well, uh, you have a couple good donors and yeah, you've you taken care of it. Up. But yeah. now, when you start about now and these projections, now we're talking about 40, $50 million a year. So from a standpoint of like, as you said, it seems like it's not that far away, but if you were a school potentially making 40 or $50 million less than your rivals, 
it yeah. feels like two, a, two years is year eternity. Is three years is oh yeah, three yeah. years doesn't. It, it yeah. feels like all till the end of time, right. basically. So yeah, that's and that's the part. The other part of it, as you mentioned, they're the two powers. Mm -hmm. Florida State and Clemson going into the season. They're still the two powers. Like if you had to handicap, who do you think is going to be the, in the ACC championship game? One or both of those, probably. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, they definitely could be there without question. And 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 really, that's kind of the challenge I think for you know Jim Phillips. You know, last you know you think about the end of the football season where you know Florida State's winning the ACC championship and he's got to hand the ACC championship trophy to to mm -hmm. Mike Norvell. And yeah. It's kind of at it, 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 a time where you know. Things are going in the wrong directions between the teams in the conference. Same thing with Clemson. If Dabo wins a national championship or 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 gets his team to an ACC title or playoff berth, you know the conference has to celebrate them and do everything in their power to help them. Yeah, because they represent the, the conference. But in the in the in the meantime, you're suing each other. It's just it's I know strange. Well, I I feel bad for Jim Phillips and all this. I, I, and I've been very critical of like his decision on the the alliance right. a few years ago. But I also think. He gets a lot of heat for stuff that he had nothing to do with. He inherited when he took the job and and it was sort of the ball was rolling in that direction. And now he's trying to, and, you know, Indiana Jones doesn't turn around and try to stop the bowler. He keeps it's running. Good. So that's that's the problem. But, yeah, it's it, it is going to be a very strange season. But let's let's talk about Florida State this coming season, because I we haven't gotten to check in on the Seminoles since spring practice. And, you know, I. We we saw DJ we were on the lay before spring practice started, and I was surprised going up there and talking to him and talking to players around there that how quickly he meshed yeah. with everybody there. When you think about, oh, this guy used to be your chief rivals quarterback. Well, the cool thing about him, chief and, conference rival. I'm sorry, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, in in the interview you did with him, I thought it came across. He he is he is a unique human being, right? Yeah. I mean, he's so mature, so self aware, so smart. And he didn't go in trying to act like he is that guy, you know, that mm -mm. guy, you know, he, he wanted to he embrace what they do and, and, yeah. and join what Florida state's doing. And I think that was really, I thought it was very interesting. Something he said, and, and Mike Norvell has, has confirmed all this. Like he went to the official visit to Florida state without an offer, mm -hmm. which in the transfer portal era for a quarterback, who's been a starter at two power mm -hmm. conference schools, like that's almost unheard of. Yeah. Like you, you get the offer and then you go, right. DJ almost kind of bet on himself in that yeah. situation because remember Cam Ward was still out there. Right. And what's interesting about that to me, and this isn't a slight on Cam Ward, I think he's a fantastic football player, but I think if you were making a decision based on, I think DJ was looking for who's going to make me, who's going to help me get to where I want to get to. Right. And he saw because Mike there's a lot Bell. of questions about him. Right. Right. Going to the next level, otherwise he'd already be there. Right. Yeah. So so he yeah he's coming back for a fifth year and he's third school and he's trying to prove himself, but he looked at the landscape and said. Florida State's where I want to go. Mike Norvell can help me get to where I want to go. I like the way their offense is run. This is where he he bet on himself, but he also identified what's going to be the best place for me. Whereas at Cam Ward, I mean, I think probably did that to some degree, but ultimately wasn't quick to make that decision. I think if if, if it was about that, mm -hmm. I think he might have made the quick decision to go to Florida State. Instead, he yeah. was trying to see the NFL, and then he ends up at Miami. Now, I, I think I think Miami probably ends up being the best. I think both quarterbacks probably wound up in the best, best place position. for them because Cam Ward goes to work with Shannon Dawson, right. who knows the offense that Cam Ward's been in his entire college career. I actually can't but, like Florida State Miami. That, I can't wait for. By the way, oh I know it's yeah. gonna be awesome. Yeah. But I but I well I guess my point is I don't yeah. know that I don't know DJ's goal was a little bit more specific. Right. Right. Yes. I mean, Cam was still trying to figure out the big picture. Yeah. And, and uh, you just got I give DJ credit for knowing exactly what he wanted. Going after it, betting on himself, and, and ultimately getting it. Yeah, I I think the the Florida State team this year will look so different. But the part that I, I was going through the roster and going through who played last year, I don't know that people realize how many guys were rotating right. in that played pretty decent sized roles last year that are just a sort of ascending into bigger roles, especially on defense. Yeah, I mean, on defense, it's it's across the board. You know, Zaria Thomas wasn't a starter at corner last year. But I think his upside is probably higher than Renardo Green, who just went in the second round of the NFL draft. And he was basically the third corner last year, but he's a big time player. Uh, had a great spring. Um, and, you know, I think you look across the board at linebacker. DJ Lundy was not a starting linebacker. The two starters were Bethune and, and Deloach, but Lundy played almost as many snaps as they did. Yeah. He's one of the top tacklers on the team. He'll be a starter now. And defensive line, you know, you've got guys that that are stepping up as well. And again, it's more Daryl Jackson 
was at times maybe the best defensive alignment of practice, but wasn't eligible all last season. That, that one's the interesting one to me because yeah. I was thinking about it when Braden Fisk got drafted. I was like, okay, how do they – oh, wait, Daryl Jackson has been sitting there right. waiting to play, and he would have played last year if he could have. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so there's a lot of situations like that. Um, but then they also did really well in the portal, and you know Mike Norvell, as he does, I mean he's he's done a really good job of marrying the marrying the two. Yeah, and uh, you know Marvin Jones Jr. from Georgia, who people may have forgotten about because he didn't do a ton at Georgia, but he looks like the five star kid out of high school who could be a game record defensive end. Well, and he also doesn't. So he doesn't have to come in like Jermaine Johnson did a right. few years ago from Georgia. And that was a situation where Jermaine, you know, was a rotation guy at Georgia, wanted to be an every down guy, wanted to show what he could do. So he goes to Florida State. He's instantly the best player on the roster. He's got to play every defensive snap. I don't think Marvin Jones walks into that. No, no. I, yeah. I just look back. I was looking at Jermaine's stats the other day. He had 70 tackles as a defensive end. But right. to your point, he was on the field <laughs> yeah. every snap and he was running plays down from behind and all that. No, you're right. It won't be that tight. There'll be more of a part of a rotation of four or five defensive ends. And so he may not have the same numbers as Jermaine, but I think he could have that kind of impact. But I think that's part of the thing that the people have missed with Florida State. When we talk about the success that Mike Norvell's had in the transfer portal, if you notice, the high school recruiting has gotten better and right. better every year as they won more. And it feels like, the development is there and the guys that they've gotten out of high school, they they're now ready to play. And you know, this is not the situation he walked into anymore. He's been recruiting off success for the last couple of years. Yeah. And that's, I think the thing from a recruiting standpoint, that is a knock on Mike Norvell and his staff is when's the high school recruiting going to reach there. I think you have to go back to his first two years at Florida state. He didn't get the bump that a lot of new coaches get because right. of COVID mm -hmm. his first year, he was part of that class. If you go think back to a lot of those head coaches that were fired that that were hired in 2020, yeah. a lot of them are still not employed. A lot of them either lost their jobs or are in, or on hot seats. And, today. and at the time, he's trying to put together a class with guys that he got to evaluate when he was the Memphis yes, coach. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it just it was a really tough situation, uh, and I think unique to anything we've ever seen before. Because really, for a year and a half, they didn't get to go on the road and recruit. They, yeah. they build relationships. He didn't have a bunch of assistant coaches who coached in Florida. So all these reasons, I think, really stunned their offensive recruiting. But he, where he got lucky was he embraced the portal yeah. and found success there with guys like Jermaine Johnson and Keir Thomas and Jay Sean Corbin and all those mm -hmm. guys early on. And that led them to get the Jared Versus and the Braden Fitz. I also think they were, some of the guys they took out of the portal early, and this is something I, I think pretty much every other program has now adopted, mm -hmm. but they did grab some some guys out of the portal who had three and four years of eligibility oh, yeah, remaining. Yeah. Now, I mean, the ultimate of that is not actually a guy that Mike Norvell took out of the portal. It's a guy Willie Taggart took out of the portal, Jordan Travis. Right. But, yeah, yeah. but like, I remember Fabian Lovett last yeah. year watching him play and thinking, wait, he started his career at Mississippi State. But Darn it feels Jones like, also, yeah. yeah, it feels like he's been at Florida State forever. Yeah, no, you're right. That's that it is. Uh, people talk about development as it can only happen with high school players. Yeah. But yeah, when you bring in these guys for three or four years or sometimes two years, I mean, a guy again, like Trey Benson, and Johnny Wilson were guys who had not done a ton at their previous schools yeah. coming to Florida state, have good first years and then really good second years. And now, you know, here they are playing in the NFL. Yeah. This is where we remind the poor Arizona state folks that you had Johnny Wilson and Ricky Pearsall <laughs> in your receiving court and Jaden Daniels and as Jayden your quarterback. Daniels. Yeah. I uh, like, Mm, Herm yeah. Edwards may uh, you got probation out of it. Yeah, Herm Edwards may need to to face him. <laughs> NCAA not not NCAA sanctions for breaking NCAA rules. NCAA sanctions for wasting that yeah. much talent. Yeah, because they weren't. Yeah, they weren't good at the time. <laughs> yeah, but it is it is amazing to think. But so, what happened last year at the end of the season? Do you see any lasting effects? From that with Florida State, or have they been able to flush it and, and kind of move on? I was worried about it at the time. I'll be honest, because you know it wasn't just that the guys were mad at the college football playoff committee. I think there was some feeling that they were let down because they bought into what Mike Norvell told them and, mm. the, and what the staff told them, just win all the games and they can't keep you out of the playoff. Well, then they won all the games. Which is a perfectly logical way to yes. say it because it's how it, how it, it had always happened. been. Yeah, It never happened. But then it did happen. So there was a little period of time where you started wondering, okay, are these guys going to question Mike Norvell? Are they going to question the staff? Are they going to question the school? Um, but I've been really impressed since that time. Uh, they rebounded quickly. I think they got those guys, you know, obviously the, the bowl game was a debacle. Yeah. Uh, and I understand why the, a lot of those guys didn't want to play. They wanted to get healthy for the draft. Yeah. And uh, and they were frustrated. So, but once they got past that, you saw them, the way they went after the, the players they went after in the portal, the way they retained guys, there were concerns about some of the guys on that team, whether yeah. they might leave. 
but they retained well, let, almost all. Let's of those talk guys. about that because that feels like something Florida State was ahead of the curve on a couple of years ago. How do they decide how they're going to retain people? How do they decide you are important? We are that you're our priority. We're going to keep because it it does seem like they've not lost anybody really that they didn't want to lose. Yeah, there's probably been a couple, maybe at most, and yeah. none, of the, none of the high-profile guys. But, yeah, I think it's a, they have a really good, healthy relationship between the, the football staff, football program, and the battle's end, uh, their, their collective. And I think what where they benefited was they weren't the first on the scene. Yeah. You know, I think what this a lot of the schools and a lot of the collectives that were the first to the market and really went hot and heavy just trying to sign whoever they could sign, make big signings and all that stuff, a lot of times they didn't know what the lay of the land was going to be yeah. or how it was all going to work out and how, how the NCAA was going to be. It, it also this. feels like they were among the first that prioritized retention right. and, over But I think they benefited by yeah. not being the first in because mm. they didn't make some of the mistakes that other people did. Yeah. So when they really got active, they realized that, okay, retention is is a different ball game. Yeah. The NCAA is not coming after schools for retaining their own players and finding NIL opportunities for them. It's more so if it's seen as an inducement or something like that. Now, so, are, are they kicking themselves for, for making a plea deal in that Alex Atkins case? I because, think there are a lot of people yeah. who feel like they, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if they'll officially say that, but yeah, they're definitely. Yeah. Because I mean, if they'd have the waited program. another month, that right. just disappears. And right. yeah. But yeah, no, they've done a really good job. I think the Battle's End's done a really good job of being. And I think that whole marketplace has evolved to where now you have these collectives that all communicate now. Mm -hmm. And so they know what the market is for certain players, certain positions. And so you don't, Florida State hasn't made the mistake of, of ruining their whole NIL structure by by going out and trying to land some huge marquee Re player. Reaching for a play. Right, right. right, exactly. It's been more about keeping the guys that they have and and they've been able to do that. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting because it, it does feel like that roster has evolved so much every year, but they've managed to kind of play the same way that the attitude seems the same. I, I'm wondering, you know, someone who's watched that team, it feels like Jordan Travis was pretty integral to that. Oh, yeah, huge. Without him, like, can DJ do that? Or can somebody else in the locker room create that? I think they were really fortunate at the end of the 2022 season that you had a bunch of like-minded guys, Jordan Travis, Jared Verse, Trey Benson, um, you know, probably Johnny Wilson, some Fabian mm -hmm. Lovett, mm -hmm. Jarian Jones, those guys that all wanted to come back and play together because they knew they had a chance to win. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, again, that's the challenge is, is, is you've got so many players are balancing NIL versus chance to win versus getting to the NFL. And I think they all realized at the end of that 2022 season when they beat Oklahoma that, that we could have a special year Let's let's kind of go into this from the mindset of like let's keep this together. Yeah, and so that was huge, and Jordan was a big part of that. And now he's going and, and talking to the other players about, hey, don't go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. you, maybe you're not going to get the biggest nil deal you, you could ever dream of, but we can do something special here. And I think again goes back to what we were talking about, why that took that team, why that team took it so hard when they yeah. got kept out because they felt like they, they were sold this, this commitment this, yeah, for yeah, a year yeah. to come back for this because you didn't have guys going to the highest bidder. In right. other schools they all came back jordan was a huge part of it jared versus a huge part of it and you see it now those guys come back to help recruit like jordan was helping recruit dj yeah um and you saw Keir thomas and Jer uh Jer and uh, jermaine johnson recruited jared it, verse it, now it does Jerverse feel to me like that. there's some ownership of the the recent guys because they helped florida state get out of this hole right. that it was in like they feel proud that they've done that and they they can they can help move it forward some more but and, and i feel like they can use that over the next few years here well for sure yeah. i think jarian jones is a great example he's not as big a name as some of those guys but jarian jones i mean he and he's talked about this when he came to florida state from mississippi state his mindset was i'm going to go there for a year or two mm -hmm. and i'm going to the nfl we end up staying there for four years and he's a guy that comes back throughout the spring he kept coming back and was trying to coach up younger guys yeah this is a guy from mississippi didn't originally go to Florida State, but now it, it views himself as much of a seminal as anybody. Yeah. And that's that's the side that that they've been able to hit on with the portal. Yeah, and I think people don't realize that that still does happen sometimes. Right. Like somebody who's from somewhere else goes to a school, falls in love, loves being there, loves the environment. Like it still happens. It's just not as common right. anymore. Yeah, it's but harder to achieve. Yeah. For whatever reason, Mike Norvell's been able to cultivate it within his program. A little easier than than some other people have yeah i think yeah. they've done a good job their whole staff has done a good job with that and and we'll see if they can keep it going because you know again now 
the problem with winning 13 games is now people people want that. It's hard to win 13 again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's it, it's hard. But yeah. here's the thing: they win 13 this year, they're making the playoff. Hey, yeah, no doubt, no doubt this time. Thank you, Ira. Thanks, man. Thank you so much for watching. Just a reminder: subscribe to this channel right here so you never miss an episode of Andy Staples on Three. And oh, by the way, watch all the other great videos on the On3 Sports YouTube channel.